Back in July of 2010, one of our members told us of his experiences as a Navy fighter pilot flying F-6S off the USS Saratoga. They were attacked by kamikazes, got hit five times, and they went into Pearl. And he's here today, and I asked him the question, did you ever hear about the kamikaze pilot from Blue Tent Missions? <laughs> I would have been that guy. Anyway, uh, what we didn't know at that time, but recently discovered, is he is probably one of the foremost experts on design and use of proximity fuses. And he's going to talk to us about that today, starting from the beginning, and he's going to lead us up to, to the atomic bomb. It was the second greatest weapon in World War II. Please join me in bringing Dick Mann up here right now. Come on. southern part of, of uh, uh, Massachusetts, near Buzzards Bay. I'd like to go to Buzzards Bay. That's a great place to go. So anyhow, <clears throat> we were at Otis Air Force Base. They didn't know what to do with us for about, uh, well, I think about six weeks. Our squadron was there with our, they broke our squadron up. And uh, I had a girlfriend in Atlantic City, because I was at the Naval Air Station in Atlantic City a year or two, two before that. So I wanted to go down and visit my girlfriend in Atlantic City. And uh, there was some Hellcats sitting around there. Nobody was using, so I went to the duty officer and I said, hey, I have some relatives in Atlantic City. Any, any chances of uh, checking out a Hellcat and flying down to the Atlantic City Naval Air Station? He said, yeah, I think we can do that. If, uh, if I went by public transportation, I'd have to go from Otis Air Force Base to Boston, take a train to New York, transfer, take a train to Philadelphia, and take a bus to Atlantic City. So anyhow, uh, he, he let me uh, check check out a Hellcat there, so I went down and visit, visited my girlfriend three times, uh, courtesy of the uh, 8th Air Force, I guess it was there, I don't know what was Air Force Base, the, the uh, officer in charge. So that, that was a heck of a deal. I thought that was fantastic that I could use a Hellcat and uh, go visit my girlfriend down there. It took me about an hour, hour each way. Worked out beautifully, so I've been go down there and stay a couple days. Uh, uh, my subject today is the uh, proximity fuse, which is supposed to have been the, the greatest technology breakthrough in World War II, uh, next, to the, next to the atomic bomb. And uh, three great victories on this were the, the uh, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, they use a proximity fuse and, and artillery shells. It's, it's the first time it was ever used on a land base because they were so afraid that the Germans or the Japanese would get a hold of this technology and, and use it against us, which, which they could have done. And, and they also, the, uh, the kamikaze attacked on the fleet and the, and the B-1 buzz bomb, which attacked uh, London. So, First thing we ought to do, I, I've always been an electronics site, in, in fact, in, in 
junior high school uh, hung around a radio repair shop there. Pretty soon they, they, they couldn't get rid of me, so they hired me. I got 50 cents a day and all the junk parts that I could haul home before working in the radio repair shop. And believe me, I had to have boxes full of radio tubes and all kinds of junk and ended up being a ham operator like a rope rope too. So it was, it was always my hobby. So I, I kind of wonder how in the heck does this thing work and what makes it go? So I passed these sheets out. I don't want to go with me along this. So, uh, the electronics part is in the top half for the, the shell slants to the middle. <clears throat> in the, in the, nose, of, the nose of the uh, electronic fuse, the, they have the, uh, the coil right up in the nose. Now that, when you have a, a, a tuned radio circuit, it takes for high frequencies to operate it uh, in sort of a la-la land at that time because they weren't too good on, on uh, too, not too much advance on, on uh, uh, high frequencies. So I had an oscillator coil on the upper left-hand corner. On the right-hand side, the, the, the uh, antenna cap was on the top. And the, the shell, these were mostly fired in five-inch shells in the Navy. Uh, and uh, uh, the shell became the antenna. And they, they had a, a transceiver. In other words, it was a, a, a pulse, like, like radar. The, uh, it pulsed high frequency signal out. If, if the, it got a reflection back from this, just like radar, the receiver would receive it. And, and the, the big uh, break on that is that the, the British were way ahead of us on radar. This was sort of a takeoff on, on radar. And there was a, a uh, on the right hand side, you'll see the oscillator detector amplifier thyro. So, what, what, what is the thyrotron? It's, it's, a, it's an electronic switch, it's a radio tube, a gas fill tube which switches several times, or several hundred times per second. So you can, you can pulse it, it transmit a signal out, you, you get a received signal back if there is a received signal. What would happen if the, the, this thing would start transmitting, which would left the barrel of the gun, and uh, when it got within uh, 60 to 70 yards of a target area and got a reflection back, it, it, would, it would clean the detonator and the shell would explode. So, in essence, this is what happened that they, they could um, uh, leave the target, just like duck hunting or for a pheasant hunting, you leave the target and, and fire the thing, and uh, if it came within 60 yards plus or minus of the 360 degree circle around there, this, the shell would explode. Now, the question is, uh, um, one of my big interests is the uh, Sylvania Electric, the company I worked for 35 years in a lighting division, uh, made, made the radio tubes on this. So they're, they're tiny little tubes. In fact, I, I have one here. This, this is a, I have two or three hands here. I can get a hold of this thing. This, this, is, this is actually a radio tube. This is a five element radio tube. It's a ceramic metal tube. So they're about the site, they're what they call peanut, peanut tubes. And uh, I knew some of the guys that worked on these. Uh, and I was uh, with Sylvania several, several years later. They made them on automatic equipment. They made several thousands of these things. Uh, so anyhow, so I have to get, in the top section, you have a radio transmitter and a receiver. So how are you going to power it? You've got to power it by batteries. First, they tried dry cells. It didn't, it didn't work too well. So somebody got the idea, hey, let's, let's, have, let's have a wet cell battery in here using battery energy. So going down here, you see the uh, electrolyte amp ample. That's really battery acid, what it is. So they had a glass container of, of battery acid in the shell. When they fired the shell, it would break the glass, act activate the, uh, the battery. Of course, the battery would only have to last for about five seconds, because that five or six seconds, that, that was a, a lifetime of fuse. It would light, light the filaments and all the receiving and the transmitting tubes uh, for just about five seconds, and that's that's all that was needed. Uh, just below the, uh, the, the the power supply in the center section there, uh, then you have a, a mercury switch and electronic detonator. So what would happen? The the transmitted signal would, would go out there. Our radio frequency would go out. It get a signal back and it was in, in range, and it would, it would 
trigger that trigger the detonator, but to trigger, trigger the um, uh, explosive explosive in the shell, most mostly in five inch shells, and uh, <coughs> so then they have the um, a couple of safety devices on that. But this is this is pretty pretty much how the thing worked. Now I uh, I saw them in use uh, on the Saratoga and on on the Monterey too. In fact, if they if Kamikaze was would start down after, and they you can see these puffs for these proximity fuse were going off, and it, it improved the uh, uh, the uh, uh, surface to air uh, and aircraft things about almost eighty percent over over three second fuses. Of course, a lot of you guys threw through flew through these uh, uh, flat. Curtains that they threw up, my hands off tape to that. Well, that, that was that was that was a bad deal, that's for sure. Okay, on the back of this page, uh, there were several companies involved in this. Uh, the, the, re, the key research came from uh, the British, of course. But it, was, it, was, it was General Electric, Crosley, remember Crosley radios, radio tube manufacturers, radio manufacturers, Eastman Kodak. Way Norris, I didn't know them in, in, Sil in Sylvania. He remembers a lot of the others because I was always in the world of radio electronics. Uh, there, there are three dots on this page. Uh, these, these were the, the primary uh, uses of the proximity fuse. The number one there is the kamikaze attacks in the Pacific. And it, it did wonders for that. I also spent, I went, <clears throat> I flew a close, close air support over a, uh, a destroyer division. Uh, which they would think would be about 100 to 200 miles out from Japan, but they did send a division of four destroyers in between uh, about 50 miles off the coast. So when the kamikaze started coming out, they would, uh, of course, see the destroyers first. They'd go after the destroyers. So uh, we were planning close air support on them. We were uh, directed from the radar on the destroyers. And they had us chasing all over the place. We knew we knew there were jam planes in Europe. We never saw them. Visibility was very bad, very easy condition. And uh, they, they gave us one of the code words. They, they called our, our division. They said, salvo, 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 which means we're going to shoot at anything that moves, which they did. So they opened up with their, with their five inch guns, a division of four destroyers. So they had uh, there's two, two turrets forward, one turret aft, firing the five inch guns. Uh, their rate of fire on that was 17 per minute, 17 five-inch shells per minute, and, and they were uh, proximity to the tip. So we, we couldn't see the planes diving down, but we, we, we could see the, the burst of black going off as these things got lower. Of course, they, with the amount of firepower on that was tremendous firepower. And when we were on shipboard and we were, we were under attack, we had a screen of about eight or ten destroyers around the fleet, the battleship in the middle, four aircraft carriers. And, and all these ships have five inch guns, turrets going like that. You've probably, you've probably seen some of these pictures. And uh, of course, normally, if we were under attack, we were supposed to stay, you know, stay below, not up on deck. But I got smoked out a couple of times, went up there and seeing this stuff going off all over the place. It was, it was a sight to behold. You've probably seen some pictures of that. So. Okay, uh, uh, the next one on here, the second dot, the, uh, let's see, one is in the Kamikaze, the second one is the, oh, oh the, uh, the, the uh, B-1 buzz bomb that attacked London. They were launching from France over there, and you may have seen some pictures of, of the, uh, the B-1 buzz bombs over there at, going after London. And actually, what they, what the, uh, the uh, British did, they moved their, their anti-aircraft batteries close to the coast. So when the bus bombs started coming over, all they had, they, they instead of setting a, an anti-aircraft uh, angle and time fuse and all this stuff, they could use the proximity fuse to sleep like they would put a duck, a duck or, a, or, a, or a pheasant or something like that. So the, their kill rate was just fantastic. It took them up to above 70% kill rate while the bus bombs pretty much put the bus bombs on a business. Let's see, the third down on there, 
is the Battle of the Bulge. <coughs> they were afraid to use the uh, approximate fuse over France or any place that the Germans could get a hold of it. So they did use them. They, they, remember, the air was all socked in at the, the Battle of the Bulge. They couldn't use air power. So they, uh, they used artillery shells with proximity fuses on them. And they were designed to, to go off anywhere from 5 to 30 feet above the target. Which, which worked very well. So the, uh, the Germans and the foxholes uh, really had no protection at all. And it, it was very instrumental in taking care of the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. I don't want to get into this thing too much here. Mainly because I don't know enough about it to get into it. Uh, the, the, uh, Okay, so I'll leave these for you. You'll have a good idea. I'll give, I'll give you a little bit of history on this. Uh, uh, they started working on this in 1940 uh, with a British help. Uh, several companies were involved in it, and uh, so there, there, there's a great deal of information available on this if you do want to get into it. So. Uh, if it were across the radio company, they were deep into this, Sylvania, uh, GE. So, I think I've covered a lot of this stuff here. So. Oh, I covered the, the battery on this thing. The, the let's saw battery. Five inch guns. So, I think I'll, I'll let it go with that. Any, any questions? Uh, yes. I imagine the uh, tubes have all been replaced with solid state. Uh, oh, 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 absolutely, yeah. This, this was before the, the transistor, transistors were, were invented. So you always had to have a, a, hot, a hot cathode. In other words, you have to have, have a, little, a, a mini light bulb in, in all radio tubes and all, any, anything electronic. So the, the transistor got, got rid of the heat source, and uh, which made the solid state stuff go real well. Sir? What is, what is the size of this in length? Uh, it protruded out from the sh about an inch and a half. So the nose sticking out there would be about an inch and a half long. So uh, work, working backwards from that, it's, uh, the fuse would be uh, yeah, about what, what look, looks like it looks like about two and a half, a little bit under three inches is what it looks like. Three inches? Yeah. Because the, the, the nose stuck out an inch, an inch and a half from the shell. Remember, the, these shells were only five inches in diameter, but they used these things out. And uh, they used the, the, the famous five, five inch, 38 caliber gun. So we often wonder, what, what the heck's the 38 about? Uh, Spook and I talked about this. It's, it takes five multiplied by 38 to get to this limit. And here under 16 inches barrel, 16 feet barrel. That they use these things on. Are they still used today, Dick? I'm sure they are, but much, much uh, more refined than this is. This is this is very, very crude, I'm sure, compared to the, the ones they have available today. Uh, Jim, do you have? Or uh, Jim, Jim? Do you know what the detonator was? The powder, the of mercury, or that aethide, or you know what it was? I don't know. That, that, that's way, way beyond my knowledge. Uh, Jim, we got a reverse reserve battery on here. You I one, understand, one yeah. Time. Is that a, 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 a over on the left side of the yeah. design is a reserve battery, so that was different than the, than the black it's different, different than, than, than the, the, the lead acid battery that they had in there, yeah. I suppose that was a backup. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'm sure this the proximity fuse are still used uh, mandatory for air-to-air -air or surface-to-air. But we uh, simplified this during the Vietnam War, where they would just put a three-foot extension on the on a bomb, and that was known as a daisy cutter. But that when that fuse hit the bottom of hit the ground here, that bomb went off three feet in air, and it really cleared out the jungle. I'll tell you, a two thousand pounder man made an instant helicopter landing spot. Oh, they, they were they were greatly afraid that, that uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, the uh, Germans did overrun some areas, and they, they captured some of the proximity fuses on them. So then they had to come up with, with a countermeasure on that. 
And what, what they did, they had a, 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 a jamming transmitter that they put on B-17s, and they fired over 1,600 shells at, at B-17s flying at 25 to 30,000 feet. And what it did, it, it, it transmitted a broad frequency across that same band, and they would be explode prematurely. Did any of you B-17 guys fly these missions? Were they, 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 they tried to come up with a, a, a proximity fuse testing, firing at the B-17s to do a smoke fire. But, but it didn't work, so they had to use live uh, shells with proximity fuse in on, on the B-17s. So maybe, maybe some of you were, were involved in that. I don't know. But the... Uh, uh, we, we had spot jammers on the B-17. Oh, you did? A guy in the radio room, okay. in kind of a bubble. Yep. And he had uh, uh, one receiver and three transmitters. And the Germans would send up a signal and he'd uh, ch cancel it. And then they changed to another frequency. He yep. was a okay. dog and cat game. So, 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 one of our members did that. Yeah. I recorded it one okay. time. Okay. One of I remember is he said that what, what happened then over the target he would push back and he wouldn't have to he'd turn off his equipment. And he looked up one day and bombed away, you know. The bombers were all had their bomb bay doors open. He looked up and there was one right there, just about ready to drop, and he couldn't communicate with the crew. So he got a hold of the radio man by waving to him. And uh, Dick McIntyre, I don't know if you remember him, and, and uh, uh, he radioed the pilot and they moved over and bombs away. And, and, that's just a, so maybe that has something to do with it. What you're talking about. It sure could be. But they, they made several, several, many, many thousands of these, but they were so afraid that, uh, you know, uh, Adolf Hitler wanted to get it, and uh, Mussolini wanted to get it, and, uh, and Joe, um, who was it, El Gore wanted to get it? He was really, really after that. So the <clears throat> second part of the program, I, I bought some. <clears throat> uh, I, you know, I've been in, I've been in the lighting business more more fifty years, thirty five years with Slovenia. So uh, this subject I really don't know very well. I I, I was going to give you a demonstration on compact fluorescence. You know, as of in the 2012, no, we're supposed to no longer use the 100 watt incandescent lamp. In 2013, you can't use the 75 watt. In 2014, the 60 watt incandescent lamp. They want to take these out of production and take them out of use and replace them with compact fluorescence because the an incandescent lamp is only about 10% efficient. Uh, you call it 100 watt. Well, uh, a wattage is not a unit of light. I lie out, but it's a unit of work. Converts to 3.4 BTUs per watt. So I was, I was going to demonstrate some of this stuff, and I'm running out of time to do it. But, uh, I'll do this at a, a, a and, and I, in fact, I even have samples for you. So if you let me come back on the program, when you miss the program again, I'll go through all this lighting stuff, which is, is uh, which I've done several hundred times, and I don't stutter and roam that because I know what I'm talking about then. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, any other questions? And I, I, Dick, I have a question. Are you available for next week? <laughs> yeah, we'll do it next week. Great. Let's give a hand. Okay. <laughs> That's it. See you next week. Not going to